Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, known as CSIAC, one of three IAC domains under the DOD Information Analysis Centers. Uh, we operate under DTIC, uh, the Defense Technical Information Center, which is within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, this is part of our informative webinar series, which highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. Our webinars present an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by primarily increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. As such, our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. Uh, we do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on some of their technical projects. Um, at CSIAC, we provide research and analysis services uh, to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from the government, industry, as well as academia to stimulate in innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. Today, we hope that you enjoy this webinar and we hope that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity. Uh, before we get started today, I just wanna note a couple commit, couple administrative items. Uh, first, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, uh, these slides are posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and you can find today's webinar. And when you click on it, at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Second, uh, all participants are muted, but feel, feel free to use the chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. Um, you can use that to chat with, with each other. Um, as the moderator, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. However, if you would like to pose a question uh, for the presenter today, um, which we will address at the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool, which is at the top center of your screen. Uh, is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. Uh, at the end of the presentation today, I'll go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, please have no fear. Uh, the full presentation will be available online. Check back to the CSI website. The webinar is posted. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will then take you to the YouTube link. It will also be on MailTube as well within a couple of days. Um, with that said, I will pass it over to Dr. Deaton. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Phil. Just a couple other wanted to start off uh, before I talk about myself and the content. I just wanted to uh, put out a few thanks. Uh, first to DTIC and CSIAC for funding the the work that went into putting together this report. This was something that I had been done as part of my regular work and just to have an opportunity to be able to share it with everyone was just, uh, it was really, really exciting for me to do that. Also for those of you who, uh, who are coming to hear and listen to me talk today, I really appreciate your time and your attention today. So thank you for coming. Also have some other individual contributors be Phil. Um, also, yeah, as an announcer, had some uh, contributions into the, the document, as well as Ryan Fowler from C, um, who worked for contract with CSIAC. Also, a couple of friends I want to thank for conversations and whatnot, uh, specifically AJ Vigil, who uh, gave me some feedback on some of the initial sections and also helped engage me in conversations that were um, elicited a lot of different ideas that went into this presentation. I have another friend named Bill Her Hilburn who also did the same. Um, he actually gave me some inspiration for some of my figures as well. Um, I had another friend from uh, named Mahmoud Horun who also uh, gave me uh, the opportunity to have conversations with regards to you know how operators are going to move to the forward in the future with the, the digital transformation in SATCOM. Um, if there's anybody else who you know can oh yeah there's also a couple of people from work um, Scott Gross and Brian Bocamp will also uh, let me do a couple dry runs on them. Um, which was really great for me to get some feedback from them on, you know, if, if what I was saying was actually, you know, true or not, and, you know, let them argue with me a little bit. So that was really, really excellent. So thank you for everybody who helped pull this together. It was a real pleasure uh, interacting with you, and I hope you enjoy this. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, you can go ahead and read um, my bio there, but just to give you something a little bit interesting about myself, 
is that um, both my my kids when they were younger started wrestling. I was a wrestling coach for about six years. I never wrestled before, and uh, I did that. And my, one of my kids is going to state this weekend, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, that gives me a little bit of this gives you a little bit more background about me. I'm just I like to think of myself as a lifelong learner, so I've worked on a like a variety of all different kinds of things throughout my entire career. But most of it's all been in telecom, starting in CDMA. And then moving in CDMA technology for cellular networks, and then moving into to SATCOM. So that's just a little bit about me. So the purpose of this brief is just to ex explain and explore the topics that are involved in the digital transformation of SATCOM, and uh, just just at a very high level, what SAT what this digital transformation is is the um, evolution of SATCOM to these next generation architectures, which is going to enable additional capabilities and also allow networks to operate with a higher efficiency and higher performance. And we'll talk about what all those individual components that enable that transformation in, uh, in, in, in evolution. So in my presentation, I've got four main sections. The first section, we'll just talk about uh, introduction where we'll introduce some basic concepts and talk about you know what are the general components of the digital transformation and then we'll talk about digitization and virtualization of satcom networks and those are probably the two most significant components of the digital transformation and then we'll end it with just a couple of use cases to explore um, you know what types of functionalities are enabled through the digitization and virtualization which which is what comprises the, the digital transformation of satcom so, and, and as we get through individual sec sections, I'll stop to ask if there's any questions with regards to that section. We'll just continue on. So, um, like I said, the digital transformation, the biggest thing about this is this is just, this digital transformation is the next generation evolution of SATCOM. And so what I wanted to try to, try to emphasize here before I actually drive in, into the introduction is that we were really looking at uh, the precipice of seeing major architectural changes in SAT, the way SATCOM ground systems are, are managed and run, and also uh, most likely seeing market current market um, ecosystems more or less turned inside out. And I think you'll start to see why those things will happen as we go through each individual component of the digital transformation. So what's kind of the motivation uh, between this whole presentation and also the digital transformation. Well, the first thing is that there is a rapidly changing space layer. As as many of you know, have read the news, space SpaceX is releasing or putting up satellites for their Starlink constellation. Amazon's beginning for their Kuiper Telesat has plans for also a constellation. OneWeb has a Leo constellation now. So it's al almost seems like everybody, everybody and the brothers now jumped on this uh, new. I want to I want to call it bandwagon, but there's a lot of emphasis on leo technologies right now however that's just that's just part of the story there's a lot of new medium earth orbit satellites that have been deployed as well as additional announcements from ses to say they're going to do leo as well and also a new pl plans for launching new geos so it's not just the the leo market although they're the major part of that story but there's a lot of different opportunities in space now that are as enabling different ways to access um, communications and other different types of applications. The other thing too is that the demand for SATCOM has had about a 21% uh, uh, or growth over the last three or four years. So, I mean, if you have a, if you had stocks that are making that amount, that amount of uh, interest, I think you'd be really happy with that. But it's like a really significant amount of, of demand. And because of that demand and more or less um, the evolution of that demand. Um, what, what we saw is a report from the, the Space Force, which uh, came out in 2020, which discussed the different issues with migrating those systems because of that large demand. But however, there's a, a huge problem with dealing with stovepipe and is isolated systems. And some of these, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the issues with, of these are, but let me just put up this figure on this next slide here, just to kind of illustrate what this point is. So in the next 10 years, we're expecting to have about 50,000 active satellites in orbit. That's actually quite a, that's like an order of magnitude more than what's up there today. And um, for the DOD perspective, um, there's quite a bit of uh, variegation in terms of access techniques and technologies to get to satellite. So 
I'd like to thank my, my other contributor, my friend, Mike Dean, who also, if you listen to him, he's a DOD SATCOM chief for uh, the DOD CIO. He, he likes to say, or you'll, if, you, if you've seen him talk, you'll hear him say that there's 17,000 DOD terminals that are managed within 135 different types of those terminals. The reason for that is, is that um, just the amount of variegation that, that happens across the entire, I guess, uh, the, the, the DOD space ecosystem. So if you look at the individual columns here, you'll see that we've broken things out in narrow band, wide band, protected, and commercial. And these are more or less just more or less kind of like waveform categories. But within those different waveform categories, we might have different individual waveforms that are supported by different modems. And then with each individual modem, we might have different models that exist in the ground segments. And then also in the terminal segment, you might have one that's for mobile um, within a vehicular. There might be a man pack type version or C and air. So uh, because of this level of variegation, there has been um, a huge push for trying to get things to be common and also um, help to help um, try to get things coalesced to something a, a little bit more interoperable so that we can don't have stovepipe inter, um, stovepipe systems. One of the things the two I want also notice I want to say about this is that at the time of most of these things were development space was kind of like a, an exquisite um, or space or satcom was just a, kind of like an, exqui an exquisite area or market in that there was very few vendors who would who would who would build to these systems and there weren't a lot of standards and whatnot around these things so some of those market pressures kind of forced things into these stovepipe systems but also the fact that development um, in terms of how uh, satcom modems were developed in, in particular the conjoining of some firmware software and hardware together um, created this in, environment or market where we had a lot of different purpose-built boxes or purpose-built appliances for different different um, functions. And so a lot of that kind of drove us into these stovepipe business models. So given that background, um, and after review of you know the problem, the DoD has actually released a, a myriad of, of RFPs and RFIs to try to address a lot of these different problems. Um, some of them have looked at looking at SATCOM as a service business model, the virtualization of SATCOM satellite modems and waveforms, uh, specifications for next generation architectures, and also next generation tactical terminals. Um, if you look at all four different service branches, you can see uh, a map, uh, quite a bit of effort um, occurring in all those. And after review of a lot of those RFIs and, and requests and RFPs and requests for white papers, what I've tried to do is uh, boil down what the key demands of these networks are, in particular the DOD, although there is a lot of application for these for this into the commercial markets as well. So I'd like to just spend a, a bit of time going through these key demands because these are things, these are things that are kind of the centerpiece of the, of the SOAR report and uh, things that I would go back to, I'd like to go back to and, and discuss for issues when we talk about the different components of the digital transformation. So the first thing is, is is a freedom from vendor lock-in. And I spoke to this just a little bit earlier on how vendor lock-in lock happened. And essentially what happens is, is when you have highly uh, specialized piece of hardware and firmware and software that go into that, those things are tightly conjoined into the box, which can only be migrated by ripping that out and replacing it with another box. So that problem has contributed to the stovepipe system that we see today, but also the un 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 unfortunate can be there are some advantages to do that, but unfortunately, there's some inconveniences that come with that, and and that and that what what that hap what those inconveniences are is that we have a market with very few vendors who can operate in that market, in that space, so that DoD's options for um, obtaining new technology or technology progression is severely limited. Uh, the second key demand is just reduction in total cost of ownership, and so for commercial markets, this is uh, much more important in that their networks need to be able to make money for them to be able to stay in business. So that's very, very important. But however, the DOD uh, costs are also important as well. So any opportunity they can to be able to reduce their operational or capital costs is, is a win for them, also a win for the taxpayer. The third key demand is ground segment uh, sustainability. And what this means essentially is that your, your network is able to uh, achieve an effective migration path. There's nothing that will blocking it. Either they could be operational constraints, they could be logistical constraints, things that just stop you from continuing on to advance your technology to the next evolution. Fourth key demand uh, is terminal and modem agility. 
And what this means is that we, the, and this is something that I won't necessarily cover today, but there's a, there's a brief uh, section of the report which talks about the antennas. And uh, there's, a, there's a great demand within the DoD to have multiple waveform, multiple bands, multiple orbits, terminal systems that can be able to access a variety of um, constellations and, and um, orbital regimes, if you will. And then, like I said, I briefly mentioned waveforms, but modems should be able to operate on a variety of different waveforms. So there might be specific satellite systems, but that might require specific access technologies or waveforms, or you know, some of them uh, may may be you know open to whatever as well. So the flexibility for those to support different types of missions and different types of um, SATCOM networks is is something that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, fourth, the fifth key demand is system agility or re resiliency. And basically, this is the ability for um, a SATCOM system, or um, when I say system, I mean incurring the ground segment and terminal segments. Basically, they're automated, and we can be able to deploy configurations and also or modify those configurations based on changing network demand. Uh, the, the final key demand is high computational density and, and efficiency. And essentially, this is an ever-growing, uh, ever-persistent requirement from the DoD. We just want to do more with less space. And so to be able to increase the amount of computation you can do in a smaller amount of space it always has uh, great attributes and for, for the DoD and also you know, with commercial stack.com networks, especially those ground segments or gateways that are running out of rack space for putting modems and other equipment into them. And there is one final uh, key demand that I wish I spent had a little bit more time to focus on, but that is just um enterprise management systems and what that basically is is just now we have all this satcom equipment out what's the best way to manage not just you know single gateway or a uh, single set of terminals but let's say you have you know five or six gateways and many you know hundreds and thousands of terminals out there what's the best way for you to manage that so that's something i don't cover in, in this in the SOAR report but i do feel like that's something i should mention that it is that is still another key demand of of uh, the dod that i've seen so let's just talk real briefly about um, the components of the digital transformation. And I'll come back to this figure throughout the entire presentation. And what this shows is basically the dependencies of, of digital transformation. And within, if you're within the box, that means you're a dependency. So for example, for digitization, for that digitization block to be completed or to be fulfilled, that its dependencies are a digital life modem, a digital life protocol, and edge device, and then so on and so forth. So for virtualization to be complete, everything in digitization has to be complete, as well as the other things inside its box as well. And what I'm illustrating here is just kind of like um, the, the dependencies of the evolutional process, but also just to give you, you know, an outline of how everything kind of plays together. And we'll talk um, in, in this introduction section, basically uh, just on we're going to touch on digitization and virtualization, and then we'll move on to our new uh, to sections where we'll dive in a little bit deeper for what those things are. Okay, let's let's talk about digitization first. So, what digitization refers to is just it. We a lot of people talk about it in uh, if we talk about a normal terminal architecture. Um, we, and we're looking at a, a, a SATCOM modem. We hear it like in the, in the, in the middle of the diagram here. The, the purpose of the, the modem is to take data bits and transmute those data bits between, um, transmute the signals between IP data bits and an analog L-band IF waveform. That analog L-band waveform is then um, mixed and amplified up to whatever frequency it needs to go that, so that it's appropriate to access the, the, satellite, the satellite network that it's going to go to. Um, when we talk, like I said, when we talk about digital um, digitization or um, it more specifically digital app interface, what essentially what this is, is we're adding this new interface, which is kind of bust the modem into half. So modem functionality is broken up into two major components. The, the baseband modem on the left there on the top, the top figure you see there, its job is to take the signals and transmit those signals between IP data bits and a digitized waveform. And then the RF front end is to take that digitized waveform and then transmit and then transmute that into an analog signal in both directions. So if we can take this modem and we and we bust it, bust it in half, and we add a digitized interface which takes those digital samples and puts them in packets, and we can send them over an IP network, then we've enabled quite a bit of flexibility into our networks. And this interface that creates this um, that 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 
supports the transport of these digital samples is what we call digital lab. And I'll have a lot more to talk about this uh, later on. But essentially, move to this architecture has, has a many, many advantages. And the first advantage is, is that we are separating out uh, what my friend H.A. Vigil likes to call the, the brains and bronze. So the brains is the stuff, the waveform processing and all the other things that are very complicated in terms of algorithmic work goes in the stuff on the left. And the edge device kind of becomes the bronze. So basically, all, all the edge device does is just takes those digital samples and turns them into analog signals. We, uh, you might even hear people refer to these, these edge devices as just merely as digitizers. And what, what they, the, 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 key, the key point to get from this is, is that we've taken specialized RF run and hardware and we've removed it from our modem and separated it into its own device. And what that enables us to do is that we've, we've separated any specialized R, RF circuitry such that we can now move digital RF modem equipment onto common hardware. That's actually a really, 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 really key point. Um, the other thing too that's very very important is that all the specialized brains operations or uh, waveform IP is now separated into its own to a common hardware device as you see on the bottom here on the left with the digital app modem. Um, the edge device necessarily doesn't have any specialized IP. It's more or less like I said, just just the bronze. So the fact that we've we've kind of moved to this architecture, it's going to uh, greatly precipitate uh, the move towards uh, more commodity type architectures, which is really great for uh, people running SATCOM networks. Um, one thing I wanna to mention too, with regards back to um, the, the, the previous uh, key demands. So as you can see, um, since we're removing uh, conjoined hardware and software and firmware, and we'll show it even more how it even gets further removed, is that we're making steps towards um, um, preventing vendors from, from doing lock-in. And remember when I said earlier that the, 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 key, how, the key how vendor lock-in happens is we have conjoined hardware, firmware, and software. Well, this is one of the good steps that removes it because we're removing the specialized hardware such that we can move to common hardware platforms. And then virtualization gets us that next step out. And, we'll, and we'll, when we dive down more into digitization and talk about how it affects ground systems, then we'll get to see a lot more of the, the benefits we can realize from this. But this is really... A uh, huge evolutionary step and the first evolutionary step that SATCOM networks will take. Now we've moved uh, digital IF modem um, to a common hardware platform, we can start invoking um, virtualization. And essentially, what virtualization is, is it's just more or less as we are abstracting the computational resources from the hardware to create what's called a virtual computing environment. So, with virtualization, we can have multiple independent virtual computing systems operating on the same set of computers or same computers. And what this allows us to do is essentially um, create a line between what our applications are and what our hardwares are. So this is uh, very similar to installing applications on your smartphone. And uh, this allows us to have a lot more portability in terms of um, a lot of portability and uh, flexibility in terms of applications. And this is actually something that uh, the mobile network operators have, have started to do within their own networks. And I'll, when we get to the virtualization side, I'll talk a lot more about what those things are with regards to the architectures that they're deploying. But both of it, and uh, the same thing is true for digitization as well. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so I'd like to stop right here and ask if there's any questions on just those introductions. And if you have any questions, go ahead and feel free to type them in the, the chat box. Well, we did receive one uh, question so far. Um, okay. Before, before we get into that, um, Juan did hit um, hint at uh, the state of the art report. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, CSI pu publishes two uh, SOARs or state of the art reports per year. Um, the SOARs are publications that uh, provide an in depth analysis of the current technologies research. Um, and the latest technical information um, available related to one of our technical focus areas. So Juan is actually the author of our latest state-of-the-art report on uh, the, digitiz the digitization of SATCOM networks, which should be published to our website soon. Um, so after this presentation, if you want to have a deep dive into uh, this particular topic, um, then feel free to uh, read the SOAR once that is published. Um, with that said, um, I will go over these couple of quick questions now before we um, continue with 
the rest of the uh, presentation. So we have one question from Steven Johnson. He says, what is the maximum distance between the digital IF modem to the edge device? Oh, that's a really great question. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. That's a good segue. I like that. Yeah. We'll, we'll address that in this next set, this next section here. Okay. I think there's another um, question in the attendee chat. Correct. So from James Sewell, who builds or owns edge device and how do we ensure that it is not proprietary? Oh, that's a, <clears throat> you know what? We're going to talk about that too. So I'm, these are great questions. I'm glad you guys are, you guys are chomping at the bit. This is awesome. Yeah. We'll address a lot of those types of things later on. Right. Yeah. That's good. I love it. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah, this is good. You guys are asking all the right questions, so this is great. You'll, we'll, and like I said, we'll answer those questions. If we didn't answer, if we don't answer those questions as we get through this material, you know, um, please ask it again. So I just wanted to point out that uh, there was an article put out by Major General Lawrence Stutstream. Um, I hope I said that right. Um, in December, who he was talking about the transformation of uh, digital transformation of SATCOM networks, and when he said the first step to this dynamic ground architecture is replacing existing analog. Intermediate frequency IF interfaces with the open digital interoperable standard, and we'll we'll talk about this. Has to go back. This has to do with um, proprietary boxes and whatnot. How we're how we're going to avoid some of that. So let's move on. Okay. So digitization of SATCOM networks. I'm going back to this figure again just to show you. We're going to talk about digital IF modems, digital IF protocols, and edge devices, and, and you know what all those things are and what's involved in terms of how they impact the the ground segment specifically. There's going back to our digitized architecture. So we want to just, I'm just revisiting this back so we can remind ourselves. We got a digital IF modem, which produce, that this transmutes signals between IP data bits and digital IF output. And we have an edge device that takes that digital IF, takes that digital IF and those signals, takes signals from digital IF and transmute, transmutes them to analog signals. So that's, that's what we So if we take this and look at a, a traditional ground system, a ground network, what we have is, Ground networks kind of have uh, three major components, if you will, other than the input for their external data, data networks. But they have the first the first component they have is what I call the proprietary modem bank, and that's all the things on the left right there. And this is uh, comprised of many different types of mo possibly comprised of many different types of modem models. And the outputs of those modem banks are these L band IF or outputs and inputs. Uh, these are two way signals. Uh, L, L band IF. Uh, the other major component of this is an L-band switching system. So that includes things like a switch matrix and a combiner and splitter. But basically what this is, is just the analog equivalent of an IP data switch network that takes signals from the proprietary modem bank, combines them onto a single um, carrier that's then transmitted out to specific um, um, sat SATCOM network or SATCOM or just a specific satellite. And uh, in that, that RF transmission system is, is that last step. So one of the things, and it's typical in these architectures, is that the, the proprietary modem bank, or just the modem bank, and the L-band switching system, is is traditionally kept in this this building called the Equipment and Electronics Building, and the distance that we can travel without the use of specialized equipment is usually maxed out at about a thousand feet between this electronics building and whatever shelter these these um, RF transmission systems are. So that's one of the big, one of the big, uh, limitations. Some of the notes here, let me look really quick to make sure I'm covered everything. Oh, the other thing too, is that as this length, this L band um, path increases, there's additional distortion and signal loss that is, that occurs. Some of that can be compensated through some specialized techniques with the equipment. However, there is still a bit of um, complications that are introduced to that, introduced due to that, in particular, this limited distance about a thousand feet. But like I said, if you have some specialized technology, you can be able to get that that distance up. But traditional that traditionally that's how it works. Um, the other thing too that it's kind of limiting by these these L band switching systems is that they tend to be monolithic in that uh, once I run out of capacity, it can be very difficult for me to add additional capacity without ripping out the entire switch and going to a larger one. And that has um, direct effects onto in, in terms of interoperability. So um, yeah, um, yeah. The, so that's just uh, just to give a little background with the ground segment gateway. Is. So now that we let's say we, we're going to take this digitized architecture and apply it to the ground segment, what can we expect it to look like? So let's let's go to that. So in the digitized ground segment, it looks very similar to our, our previous slide, except we're replacing 
the proprietary modem bank with the digital app modem bank and our um, L, our L band switching system is now replaced with the digital app LAN. And our edge devices then become part of our RF transmission systems. And so um, the distances we can support with these new, with a uh, single mode fiber and uh, 100 gigabit ethernet are between two to, 40, two to 40 kilometers. And this is just a standard transceiver you can buy off the shelf, no, no specialized equipment required. And to me, uh, when I saw this, I was actually very, very impressed with um, the progression that um, uh, that traditional um, IP-based switching equipment has been able to, to get to. So that was actually pretty eye-opening to me. Um, the other thing too, is that with uh, an appropriate protocol, the digital IF could hypothetically go to an unlimited distance. If you're going on a wide area network and have a remote site, your digital app modem bank can now reach sites that are not located in the same, you know, in that same 40 kilometers or not within your own local area network. This is perhaps one of the biggest advantages in terms of resilience in that we don't, we're not necessarily limited now to our individual um, gateway sites for where our SATCOM traffic can go, can originate from and can go out to. So that's, that's, that's very, very critical. Let me just check my notes here for a few things, things I wanted to cover. Oh, and like I talked about earlier, the L band switching system uh, contributing to the length of the, the analog path, which um, creates distortion and also uh, signal loss. But now we have a digital F uh, LAN, which is sending basically data packets through. So there's no loss in terms of signal quality as it travels through through the these, these LAN networks. The only um, uh, path of analog signal we have is very, very narrow and short compared to our previous architecture. There's no need for um, these analog switching systems. And also uh, the analog base with the, the digitized or the digital LANs can now be increased modularly. So if there's a need to increase capacity, all that's needed is require, you know, just to buy another switch and, and connect it up to the network. Um, the other thing too, that's really important to this is that um, with removal of the proprietary modem bank, we're actually reducing the number, because we can move to common hardware because of this architecture, we're reducing the number of proprietary based systems or purpose-built modems and moving to some the common hardware. So this, as you can see, will reduce a lot of, um, um, logistical complications for, for managing parts and whatnot, and also um, enable um, network operators, uh, SATCOM network operators to be able to select whatever equipment they want in terms of you know, common equipment and drive, drive their um, applications vendors to like waveform vendors to develop for that equipment. The other thing too that's it's, it's, um, interesting to point out is that because the edge devices have um, very little uh, intellectual property with inside them. There's a very low outboard barrier to entry to, to make these devices. So with an, assuming that we have an interoperable interface for the digital IF, that is actually going to enable these devices to more or less be drop-in replacements. So the fact that we have different vendors to, to developing these device, devices or have you know maybe some proprietary baseness inside them, um, that necessarily won't impact um, you know, the performance of these individual devices or the replaceability of them. And the fact that the, uh, these edge devices, you know, with the proper digital app um, protocol, they could enable the, any type of waveform to be able to travel through them. Uh, I talked about, so we have scalable geographic diversity because of the WAN and also system resiliency. Uh, okay, yeah. All right, I'll move on to the next slide. I think I got everything I wanted to cover for that. Let's talk about how things are being used currently. Um, in, in this similar type of architecture. So um, right now where we see this, this approach being used is in these applications called ground stations as a service. And so what happened is, is in about 2014, there were a number of different Leo operators who had, who uh, primarily, well, most of them did earth observation missions. And um, a lot of these startups didn't want to have to go out and build out their own ground infrastructure. So what happened is that they are actually contracting with folks like Microsoft and Amazon to buy this service called Ground Stations of Service. And what they do in this service is they tell the tell Amazon or Microsoft, hey, my satellite's gonna pass over at this time over, the, over these particular gateways and I want you to collect on this band. So 
with edge devices that are out there currently, what happens is this, the, these edge devices are essentially just spectrum vacuums or signal vacuums. They take all this, this RF data, collect it, right? And they transport it using their own proprietary digital lamp signals, which is based on this protocol that's based on this, um, not sorry, protocol, but like a data representation language called a bit of 49.2, which basically just tells us how to interpret these digital samples. And this, it, those signals are transported over a network and then they go to a cloud system where they're stored and then later processed to be able to extract out what the actual um, download, if you will, of those satellites were at that time. And then the, those, um, those Earth observation products can go directly from their, di their digitized waveform representative of, of those signals down to their, to their specific data products and release. So there's a lot of advantages for these LEO markets to do, to do this. The other popular business model or uh, application that this is that's been um, that this has been deployed is, is with a with a TTNC to let um, telemetry tracking and control of sat satellites. So we have and we have cases where we have these low bandwidth um, low bandwidth, not necessarily uh, latency dependent or latency constrained applications where um, these edge devices can be able to collect this information and support these new services to give these, these operators ground up um, advantages. So this is a, how we're seeing some of the eco ecosystem transfer. So what in terms of SATCOM, what can we expect uh, moving towards the future? So um, the, the Army recently uh, put out, not well, it was recently, it was, I guess it was last year, their first look at what's called the Enterprise Digital F Multi-Carrier Modem. And in that, they had a notional architecture in terms of what they thought, what their vision was for a digitized architecture. And uh, I'm, I'm just showing you kind of my interpretation of it with my own, my own diagrams and figures and whatnot. So very, very similar to what we had, what I showed earlier. And we have the digital modem bank there, the digital LAM. And there's this new network element that's similar to combiners and dividers from the analog system called the digital digital IF aggregator, de-aggregator, or affectionately called as called the DAD. And essentially what that does is it just, it takes these digital IF um, individual IP streams, combines them into a signal dream, stream to send them to an L-band edge device. And um, those DADs could be rerouted out to another, let's say if there's some type of remote site that needs to get these signals, they can be used as like a, power, a point of collection and routing out to those sites. Although we could see as I showed in my, my previous figure, we could see that those uh, edge devices could be those those um, those those devices that provide that that combining and uh, splitting functions. But that's definitely something that will be different in uh, ground segments uh, in the future. All right. So I talked a lot about saying if there is an appropriate digital IF protocol, interoperable digital IF protocol, and this is what. This is, a, I get really, really excited about this particular topic and that um, just in August, there was a consortium that was uh, pulled together called the Digital IF Interoperability Consortium, or, or as we affectionately call it, DIFI. And this, this is an IEEE uh, standards body that's been formed by industry and the government. Last I checked, there's pretty close to 30 different members that are in this from industry and the government. Um, ranging the whole gamut from um, satellite network operators to vendors to band switching system vendors to, um, like I said, uh, this, like I said, there's a ma many different space forces and there are many different uh, uh, people that are joining this group. So this is very, very exciting in that we're starting to see a lot of push for creating this interoperable protocol. And what Diffy is, what was released initially in, in the first Diffy standard was just essentially a couple data packets, uh, signal data packets, which would, would well, I'm sorry, one signal data back and then two context packets, which allow you to just to be able to interpret what those packets of digitized samples are. And uh, those are going to be going over UDP, over IP and Ethernet. However, um, this is OK for if you have like a direct connect, um, probably even a LAN connect where you have very low amount of traffic. This is probably OK. However, there is still the need for some additional functionality that's going to go to this digital IP protocol. Um, and these, these things are uh, flow control, packet loss recovery, and security. So these are things that are that are being pursued right now in the Diffie Consortium to be able to enable this um, to become a reality. But like I said, the, the first iteration is out there right now. 
Um, I just want to touch on what those what those different components are that the Diffie Consortium we're working on. Um, uh, so flow control, basically, this just is the ability for us to deliver digital samples to match the rate of the consumer. So you might not know this, but actually, um, it, there's there's a difference in clocking between uh, th there will be a difference in clocking between the digital live modem and the edge device. So it's important that we have the rates finely tuned in so that um, data can be processed as fast as it's processed at the same rate it's received. Um, if it's if too much data is sent to the edge device, what can happen is a buffer overflow, and what that'll means is that we're dropping digital digital um, digital sample packets. And this will kind of be this is sort of similar. This flow control problem is kind of sort of sort of similar as a real time streaming video. It's where like let's say you if you're not sending fast enough, what will happen is that you'll have instances where the video will stall or or kind of will stall and stop because it's waiting for packets to come. They're either delayed or drop. Um, that's a different problem, but anyways, or if they're coming too fast, you might have skips in the video. So those are things we want to avoid, especially in SATCOM. Those problems are can cause modems to become a lock and are pretty severe. Um, packet loss recovery is, is just another technique to be able to deal with uh, transmissions of packets over over uh, a wide area network. Uh, specifically, like if when we're doing normal transmissions, uh, the, the traditional protocol that's used is called TCP. And what that uses is just standard retransmissions and um, the far side saying I didn't receive a specific packet. Well, with um, particularly with um, real time streaming digital digital samples, uh, retransmissions may not be good enough, and also they introduce a uh, uh, a buffer delay, which is something we would try to minimize. So there's techniques like packet forward or correction that need to be explored for that. And additionally, and the final thing is is that security so we have these digital live streams going everywhere now there's going to be the need for authentication for edge devices to authenticate their receivers and for digital IF modems to authenticate the you know edge devices to say hey you know i can send to you you can send to me to make sure that there's no hijacking or uh, interception redirection of streams and then possibly even um, things like security for those individual streams all right all right, so I talked about digitization. Um, I want to see if there's any other questions. I think there's one in the attendee chat. Uh, Bill, did you have any, are there any questions for the digitization section? Yes, we did have um, a couple more questions come in. Um, I know, I believe that you answered uh, the two previously, but uh, I'll read those over just to just for completeness. Um, so our, our initial question, uh, our first one was from Steven Johnson. He said, what is the maximum distance between the digital IF modem and the edge device? Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe. Right. That was yes. Answered. Yeah. Yeah. We answered that. And for the, for the land case, you know, local land is probably going to be between two to 40 kilometers. And then obviously with the WAN case, it's unlimited. It's limited to how much delay you're willing to, to accept. Okay. Thanks. Um, our next question was from James Sewell. He said, who builds or owns the edge device and how do we ensure that it is not proprietary? Right, so there's very limited amount of edge devices out on the market today. And most of them are for those applications that I mentioned for the ground stations of service. Um, so look look out, edge devices are coming really soon. So, and digital app modems are coming really soon. Thank you. And our newest question is said from Steven Johnson as well. If digital IF is used for GW resilience back up to sites over 40 km, how do you deal with timing issues over long distances when the network switches gateways? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that has to do with some of the flow control issues. That's the primary issue. Primary issue is flow control. And um, well, we're that is an issue we're working through the Diffie Consortium right now, uh, of which Invisacom is a member of the board and also the working group specification working group and uh, that'll probably be something similar to and, I, and we haven't worked all the details yet and this is just my own personal feelings is that this is probably something similar to ptp um, uh, precision time protocol at the ip layer and that'll allow just synchronization in, in terms of that way just exchange of clock information and then that might be good enough to to correct most of the things in terms of the packet interface um, local clocks will always need to be used as well um, there is also some issues that we need to explore in in terms of that, but um, yeah, that that that's a that's a really great question, and that that is an issue that we're going to work through in the Diffie Consortium. Thank you. That's all the questions we have at this. Point. All right. 
All right, let's move on to uh, the virtualization section here. So um, looking at virtualization, so what, what the outcome is, I, I talked about this at quite, uh, quite length, how digital AF, um, the digital AF protocol, that's kind of like the linchpin for digitization to be able to work along with these different edge devices, edge devices and digital AF modems. But what that will enable is just the move to common hardware platforms, which is going to further enable that, that springboard for virtualization to, to take off. And in this virtualization section, there's, there's kind of three main topics I want to talk about. It's just uh, it's uh, NFV or network function virtualization, um, operational support systems and business support systems and management network orchestration. And we'll talk in a lot of detail about what these individual are. But before I, I continue, I just want to talk about first, um, uh, when I talk about virtualization, especially in the SOAR report, even in this paper, I mentioned kind of two different perspectives to look at it from. The first perspective is it's just uh, virtualization from, from an abstract concept. And this is just that first abstract concept. And essentially, um, the nuts and bolts of it is, is that in a normal system on the left we see is that we have some type of common hardware. We deploy our operating system on it, whether it be CentOS or, or other type of a Linux, Linux platform, Windows or whatever. And we put our applications on top of that. And that's how you know, most of us work with our laptops and other computers. However, with um, uh, in a virtualized system, we add another layer into this cake, and that's called hypervisor. And what that allows us to do is do that. that um, resource abstractions so that we can do individual uh, virtual boxes or virtual computing environments on top of that. And that's kind of like fundamentally what virtualization is. It's the ability for us to take and abstract out our resources into reconfigurable units such that we can assign them to different functional components. Um, now, virtualization, when we talk about in, in, in the larger sense is, I will, if, if I go back to my diagram here, is I'm talking about virtualization in terms of like that concept and also these other three things, NMV, OSS, and, and MANO as well. So that would be the second perspective. So I'm gonna talk about, when I talk about virtualization now, it's gonna kind of be within that second perspective. So um, before I actually talk to this figure, I need to give us a little bit of background and essentially what happened with the mobile network operators like you know Verizon and, and, and and AT&T is that when they migrated their, their radio access networks from, you know, 2G to 3G, 4, 3G to 4G, what, what happened was is that with each evolution of the, of the architecture, there were sets of boxes that were basically, they were proprietary built, right? They had conjoined hardware, software, firmware in them to be able to perform these different network functions. So every time that they, they had to do a refresh or upgrade to the next generation of systems, they had to pretty much replace all this equipment. So that was something that they didn't really like to do because for one, it affected their businesses and also it was very costly. So that moved them to want to be able to use um, virtualization in the first perspective to be able to um, achieve a higher, higher objective in that. If we were to virtualize these individual network elements and put them together to form type of useful function, what would that look like? And that's where network function virtualization was born. So this is just a very uh, generalized and simplified version of what the network function virtualization architecture looks like. So at the very, very bottom of the network function virtualization layer, we have our infrastructure layer, our NFV infrastructure. And with that, this, that's just all the computing resources that are provided for. And of course, we talked about how the hypervisor provides virtualization to those. The virtual network function layer is the layer that is just basically our individual virtual, virtual machines or whatnot. They're connected together. And uh, above that, we have our OSS, uh, BSS systems. These are basically the business components and representative functions that allow a network operator to execute and run, their, run these virtualized systems. They could even be uh, application porters for customers to be able to order services. And then the, and the MANL system or management network and orchestration. Um, what, what this is used for is basically has the responsibility for deploying, configuring, and termination of different uh, virtual network functions. So if, to put this in kind of a more of a higher level context, if you if you purchase services or computing um, uh, resources on Amazon, what that looks like is you enter kind of like your application portal that'll allow you kind of selection of different, like a menu of different types of computers you want based on RAM, um, hard, hard disk and possibly CPU resources. So that would be like your application portal. And once you like click on that button, what essentially happens is that their, their MANO system will go off 
and create a virtual machine based on whatever hardware resources they have available that gives you that back. So that's at a very high level how it works. Uh, for the virtualized ground segment, if we take these concepts and we place, we, we put our, our virtualized ground set, our digitized ground segment underneath that in the infrastructure layer, you can kind of start to see and realize how these things might operate in, operate in the future. The first with the digital modem bank, because we're, we're basing these on common hardware, we can have virtual network functions and SATCOM functions working on here. That's, this includes waveforms, perhaps things like SD-WAN, or even um, applications that we may have not have thought of yet. Um, they don't necessarily have to be waveforms. They could be uh, anything that can receive and, and receive signals and transmit signals or applications we can deploy in these different types of systems. Um, if I was to say this is pretty much going to be like the what I want to say, like the holy grail in terms of what SD uh, software defined radio wanted to be. The edge devices, um, probably not, uh, they, they may just end up being like a, a physical network element instead of a physical network function, instead of maybe a virtualized network function, but there's also the possibility to, of deploying uh, digital layout transport hosts to be able to help manage traffic and whatnot going through. And then also, um, there's not going to be the need for a specific box for you to deploy your network management systems in anymore. This could just be deployed on any system, which I think, you know, the industry has already moved to today. That network management system will be then virtually connected all together using these concepts of virtual network functions. And we see some of these, um, some of these concepts are being heavily leveraged, especially for SD-WAN type architectures. Um, we, if you look at it, there was a recent announcement that SES um, actually went out and is a, collaborating with, with another company to deploy and virtualize all their different SD-WAN functions so they can enable um, more effective transport, data transport across their networks. So I'd like to just go through and just have like a little bit more specific example. Um, I talked about the Amazon example, but I just want to go through and show you how these signals might go through a different layers to perform this thing called a service chain. So a user operator might, let's say, might want to have a specific waveform, specific functions, have to have some type of order in mind, a service level agreement, whatnot, that they want to try to be able to invoke and realize on, on their own systems. So the service order will be processed by their OSSBSA system. And then that it translates that into some type of service chain request. So when that service chain request is sent to uh, the MANO system, what it'll do is it virtually figure out and configure all the individual virtual network functions that need to be deployed, as well as allocate those resources um, from the, the infrastructure on the systems. Then once those things are completed, um, service confirmation is given back up to the OSS BSS system, and then any monitoring control can happen through the user operator functions interfaces. So essentially, um, we're, we're, on, we're getting close to having uh, uh, the technologies all in place for us to deploy built to order SATCOM networks. And to me, this is very, very exciting. And this is something um, I would probably be told you uh, if somebody told me this maybe 10 years ago, I probably told them they were crazy. But um, just the fact that we see these technologies already being deployed and used in other different um, telecom segments and to know that we can do them today uh, very, very soon is actually really, really encouraging and really, really exciting as well. So the, this, this gets me very, very, very excited for what the future is going to bring. Okay, now I just have some just... Uh, some basic use cases um, just to illustrate some of the, the concepts that I've taught. Oh, uh, I think we had a question. Do we have another question about uh, virtualization? Bill? No, I, I didn't see one come in. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep going then. All right. So I'm just going to close out. I just have a couple of use cases to demonstrate um, or give you a couple of illustrations about how these, these systems might operate in the future. So I'm just going to show, like I said, just two of them. The first one is just uh, modem terminal and modem and terminal agility. And just give me a minute. Basically, what this is just showing is that um, we have um, our our virtualized um, architecture here based on the the VNF or uh, NFV architecture, and we've got our, our MANL system, which has these different potential virtual uh, we've got waveforms we can deploy. These are VNFs that could be deployed. We've got a monitoring, um, like this could be like a Spectre monitoring type application as well. We also have like a artificial intelligence classifier, like we might be looking at signals, trying to find something 
in the signal, whether it be like another interferer or something like that. So basically we have kind of like this, this, this kind of menu of things we want to deploy. And our current VNF we're showing here, we've got um, stuff assigned in the red. So these are our red virtual, virtual network functions, which are deployed on the red, red infrastructure here. And then we've got our blue infrastructure, blue, our blue virtual network, um, our virtual network functions, and then our blue um, hardware elements that are deployed with those, those functions. So what I want to illustrate with this is that our, our digital modem bank, it can, it's capable in the future, will be capable of deploying these functions how, however it sees fit. It doesn't necessarily matter which waveform or which uh, applications I use, but I can use them however I please and, and see fit. And, uh, and assuming that we have, you know, uh, multiple, multiple B, multiple access to all these different SATCOM networks as well. That, that's probably in a SOAR report in and of itself, but just moving on. Let's go to the next slide. And I talked a little bit with resiliency, uh, system resiliency, and um, and the real slide when I earlier slides when I discussed digital app. But this is just to illustrate the point: is that uh, we have just different paths here. Uh, the red path is just showing, you know, we have this digital modem bank, a uh, digital modem, this digital modem bank going across this digital app, digital app land, going across this edge device and the RF transmission system back out to another terminal out in the field. Uh, but I've also showed these two paths, the blue path and the purple path. What they show is that the originating gateway and the uh, what I call the digital transmission system, and which includes the edge device and the RF transmission system, don't necessarily need to be at the same location anymore. If there is a, um, a digital IF um, uh, WAN that where, where, where these, um, or I call digital IF interfacility link, that 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 goes through here we can enable uh let's say like um let's say the the red path experiences some type of interference well that path can then be rerouted out through let's say through sat3 instead of through a sat1 so this is just uh uh other ways that resiliency can be can be realized through um using alternative uh satcom um i'm sorry through using different um edge device paths or originating from different uh, digital modem paths. And that, that's kind of a, the, 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 the big thing in terms of what, what digital life brings to the table. Um, the other thing too is like, um, I didn't really talk about this, but you can, you can imagine now also is that from a SATCOM terminal perspective, we can start to increase the distance between our antenna and also where our signals go back to. As some people refer this back, refer this to as like a baseband or um, if you're in like a, an operations uh, setting, it might be like a tactical operations center. So your antennas or SATCOM connections can be now dragged very, very far out because we're not restricted by an analog cable. We can use a, fi we can use a fiber and send that way out. So that's another uh, aspect of how um, the uh, digital IF and, and virtualization can help in terms of uh, operational deployments. So that's all I had. I think there was one more question um, or maybe two more questions, Phil. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, we did have a lot of feedback. Um, very interesting topic. I would also like to remind our members that uh, the state of the art report will be published to our website shortly. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, the recording of this webinar will also be on our YouTube site shortly as well. So um, when you do get a chance to read the state of the art report, if you do want to refer back to the presentation, kind of help put uh, some of those pieces together that will be available. Um, but we did have one new question come in as well. Um, I believe we addressed all of the others. Um, so these are some of our first questions. So as I cycle through, we, we addressed this one as well. Oh, can um, you go back to the other one? Can you go back to um, sure. sure, no problem. Hold on one second. I can renew all of them. Go from there. Uh, so this was our first question. Uh, what is the maximum distance between a digital IF modem and an edge device? Uh, mm -hmm. I believe that was that was that was answered. Um, then our next question was who builds or owns the edge device and how do we ensure that it's not proprietary? I believe that was answered as well. Yeah. Um then we had a question um, about dealing with timing issues um, right. in relation to the distances that was answered. 
Um, so the next question we have is, can you say a few words about basic SATCOM resiliency? Yeah, that's a, I mean, we talked about how some of that could be used with digitized, um, with the digital app interface, we can use, improve resiliency that way. Um, it, it, resiliency is kind of like a hard problem because it's like one of those things where you have like all the blind men touching the elephant, they all touch a different part. Um, the other thing that's also exciting about slot cam resiliency is that you can now start having um, independent, uh, uh, I guess, SATCOM systems you know, simultaneously and then able to coalesce those individual outputs from those waveforms into a single data point and maybe using it to spread across. That could be another way you could increase uh, SOC and resiliency. The other, uh, the other thing you could do, also do is like, let's say that you are in a, a in an operation of some kind and you have a narrowband waveform, but uh, for some reason your mission requires you to go to some type of protected or wideband type waveform. Well, that could be something that could be uh, deployed as well. So those are just uh, three different ways um, this, these new concepts can improve SATCOM resiliency. All right, thank you. And we have one more question come in uh, from Jacob. How close is oh, Lithium yeah. addressing flow control? Yeah, that's a great question. It's just something that we just began to address. Um, it will be interesting to try to see how how it all how it all plays out, just because of the it, um, uh, there. There's always competing interests and whatnot, and also the move toward argument towards you know we want to make sure that. Uh, uh, hardware vendors have a way to differentiate themselves, but also be interoperable. So there's always that kind of uh, that uh, 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 what's the word conflict of interest at play. So, but I think that flow control. I think I, I feel pretty confident the flow control will be something that will resolve before the end of the year. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that it'll be done. It's it's like uh, in, in terms of you know my feedback to the DP committee right now is that yeah this is the next thing we need to address because is, is the next. This is probably the most important thing right now, in my opinion. Okay. And I believe that is all of our questions that we have for today. Uh, it's actually 102, two minutes over, so uh, perfect timing. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Deaton for the presentation today. Again, these slides are up on the website. Uh, the recording will be up in a couple days. Um, our next webinar will be March 22nd on data science and machine learning enabled terminal effects optimization. Uh, we hope to see uh, everybody there as well. Um, and thank you for, for today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you everybody for attending and thanks for the questions. I really appreciate it. And uh, feel free to get a hold of me on LinkedIn or, you know, you have my email address right there if you have any other questions or whatnot. So thank you again. All right. Take care.